afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, for tuning in today. So today's briefing will look a little different, but I can tell you and assure you that it will be informative. Uh, as I mentioned a couple days ago, Dr. Proton Raman will be with us again at our table today. It's been here a few times, providing some valuable insight into and updating us on a number of scenarios and evidence and modeling and so on. And so for those of you who may forget who have not seen Dr. Pro, uh, Dr. Raman before, he's a clinical scientist at Eastern Health. He's also a professor of medicine at Memorial University. And when this pandemic started, we asked that the NELCHI, the Newfoundland and Labrador Center for Health Information, to bring together a team to help inform our health system planning for COVID-19 and for this pandemic in Newfoundland and Labrador. And of course, this was about making sure that we have uh, the facilities, the acute care facilities and others available in, in case we had to deal with some urgent issues around the pandemic. So what this team did was help us plan, they help us prepare for your healthcare needs. And Dr. Raman, of course, led this core analytics team. So uh, what's, what we're going to, to do today is we'll start normally as we always do with Dr. Fitzgerald's update on the COVID numbers for Newfoundland and Labrador. And during that, she will give a presentation and talk about how the COVID how the virus spreads even through droplets, which is one of the reasons why it was recommended that we continue to wear a mask. And Dr. Fitzgerald will have some useful yet informative information as always to share with you about this today. So after that, Dr. Raman will talk about <coughs> the evidence where it's not what it's now showing us. So I'd ask you to pay attention. I know many of you are interested in the updates and numbers and so on, but even more than that today, Dr. Fitzgerald will have some information that we'd ask you to pay particular attention to. So Dr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Raman, for being here as well, uh, and to those online for joining us today. I'll uh, begin with an update of our numbers. So since the media advisory yesterday, we have no new positive cases, and our total number of cases remains at 261. One person is in hospital due to the virus, and 255 people have now recovered. And in total, we have tested 11,907 people. Today, uh, I'm advising people who traveled on Air Canada Flight 8018, departing Montreal at 6.25 p.m. on May 22nd for St. John's, that they should monitor for symptoms of COVID-19 and consider contacting 811 for testing. While the risk of exposure to COVID-19 on this flight is very low, out of an abundance of caution, we are making this recommendation. <clears throat> as well today, I'm advising that people from Newfoundland and Labrador who work on a rotational basis outside of the province, but within Canada, will no longer be required to remain on their property during self-isolation upon return to the province, provided they are not symptomatic and are not coming from a facility involved in an outbreak investigation. <clears throat> they will have to remain within their household bubble, but may go for walks, car rides, bike rides, and the like. They must physically distance from those outside their bubble and are not permitted to enter public buildings at this time. Some of these workers are effectively always on self-isolation as they do so at work and once they return to the province. This can take a great toll on their mental health. We feel this measure strikes a balance between personal health and public safety. Okay, so while we've turned the corner on the first wave of COVID-19 in our province, it is not unexpected to see new cases of the virus as we did yesterday. COVID-19 will remain with us for the foreseeable future and our collective actions will continue to dictate the impact it has on our families and communities in the coming weeks and months. We have learned a lot about this virus in a relatively short period of time and today I will provide a brief presentation to help further this understanding, when it comes to COVID-19, the proverb that knowledge is power most certainly rings true. So, um, in order to prevent the, the transmission of COVID-19, it's really important to know how it spreads. And COVID-19 is spread through what we call droplets. And uh, droplets come from people who are infected with COVID-19 when they cough, sneeze, talk, or sing. 
and these droplets can travel up to six feet or two meters in the air. If you can, ca you can catch COVID-19 if you are close enough to an infected person that their droplets enter uh, your nose or mouth or through your eyes, through what we call the conjunctiva, the, the, the red parts of the eyes. Um, if you touch a contaminated surface and then touch your face, uh, then you can get COVID that way as well. Because droplets from an infected person can be transmitted so easily, it is imperative to stay at home if you are sick to prevent spreading COVID-19 to others. If you're sick with um, symptoms such as a cough, fever, runny nose, sore throat, it may not be COVID, that's absolutely true. However, uh, you should stay home in case it is, and of course, consider calling 811 to get tested. Prevention remains our best defense against COVID-19, and we must continue to practice the measures we, that have served us so well to date. Physical distancing has proven to be one of the most effective ways to prevent the spread of this virus. Therefore, if you stay six feet away from others, there is less risk of dro that their droplets will reach you. When it's not possible to remain six feet apart, wearing a non-medical mask may help reduce the spread of the virus by catching your droplets in case you are infected but not showing any symptoms. Coughing and sneezing into your elbow or tissue will also help prevent your droplets from spreading to others. And proper hygiene, such as washing your hands often and well or using a hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol, is another key prevention measure. <clears throat> we know this virus enters the body through the eyes, nose, or mouth, so it's important to avoid touching your face at all times for that reason. So the last few months of living with COVID-19 have been difficult to say the least, and the sacrifices we have each made to keep our loved ones and ourselves safe are immeasurable, but they have worked. It is because of our actions that we are able to continue to move forward, slowly but surely, to regain many of the freedoms we've temporarily lost due to COVID-19. So with that in mind, effective today, people may further expand their double bubbles up to six people. However, this does not mean you have to invite more people to join your bubble. You absolutely do not. In fact, I would still encourage you to keep the number of close contacts that you have as low as possible as this is one of the best ways to reduce your risk of getting COVID-19. A close contact is someone you live with or have been, in, been in closer than two meters to for periods longer than 15 minutes. Expanding your bubble is not about randomly looking for others to join. We all have people in our lives who we look to for friendship and support and who prior to COVID we saw several times a week. As I was talking, I'm sure one or two people jumped into your head as who that would be. So these are the people we're talking about. Likely there are other family members or friends that you have dearly missed and have not been able to see. So what we're hoping and what our goal is of this extended bubble is to allow more social connection with those people who are so important to us while keeping your risk for COVID-19 as low as possible. If you do choose to expand your double bubble, New members do not have to be from the same household, but once they've been decided, they should not change. Before determining if and how to expand your bubble, it is best to have a discussion with other members of your existing bubble to decide how and to whom your bubble should be extended. Please remember, when you invite others into your bubble, you are also indirectly coming into contact with members of their bubble as well. And we know that individuals over the age of 60, and those with compromised immune systems, and people with underlying medical conditions are at an increased risk of more severe outcomes for COVID-19. So if you fall into one of those categories, please carefully consider whether or not you should expand your bubble, and should you choose to do so, how to do it safely. So for more information about how to safely expand your bubble and important things to con consider before doing so, please visit gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19. No matter what you decide about expanding your double bubble, please continue to be vigilant about, uh, to avoid bursting your own or anyone else's. So I want you to all remember four words, people, space, time, place. These are the important things you need to know um, to try to reduce your risk as much as possible. 
So the more people you interact with, the greater the risk of spread. So keep your contacts, your number of contacts outside your bubble as small as possible. Physically distancing is crucial to reducing your risk of contracting COVID-19. So be sure your space can accommodate this. If you're in a space with people, give enough room so that you can be six feet apart. The risk of infection increases as people spend longer amounts of time together. So please consider that as well. And spending time together indoors is more risky than spending it outdoors together. So think about that when you consider the place that you interact with people. To further prevent the spread of COVID-19, please continue to practice safe physical distancing with people outside your bubble. Call 811 if you have symptoms and keep track of your interactions with others. So in closing, while it would certainly be fair to say that COVID-19 has presented us with significant challenges, so too has it provided us with great opportunities. It has given us a chance to slow down and reconnect with our children and families, to come together in unity and support to lift one another up when the chips are down, and to prove once again that in the face of hardship, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians will always rise above even the greatest of adversities. For all, all we have accomplished together, I could not be more proud. So thank you for doing your part, and we will see this through. Hold fast, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, and a few changes in self-isolation measures, the importance of staying six feet away, and why we stay six feet away. It's always good reminders on the public health measures that Dr. Fitzgerald and her team has put together. So I want to also echo Dr. Fitzgerald's remarks about expanding your bubble to more than six individuals and keep in mind that you, if you don't feel safe, well, this is not something that's a must, something that you must do, but also don't feel pressured. Make sure you do what you're comfortable with. And I already know some of you are thinking about all who those six people would be, but keep in mind it's about people, space, time, and place. So the idea that you can add up to six uh, people, if it doesn't mean you have to, just do it if it feels right for you. Remember, although we are expanding, uh, it, it must all be in areas as we move forward into our new normal. Your priority should always be protecting your family, protecting yourself, making sure that you are safe. I did mention that Dr. Pro Proton Raman is with us uh, today and is fitting that we have him back at this time, and Dr. Fitzgerald has expanded our bubbles as we look as we move now into alert level three in just a few weeks. We thought it would be good for him to come back and share some of the latest evidence and information that he's been able to gather. So I uh, now hand it over to Dr. Rahman for his presentation this afternoon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much, Premier Bell, for giving us the chance to uh, present again. It's getting pretty comfortable in this chair to let you know. <laughs> Um, and so this is work on behalf of Memorial University. So this is um, from disciplines of biology, math, statistics, and medicine, uh, from engineering from University of Toronto, Eastern Health, and as well the Newfoundland Labrador Centre for Health Information. It's a little bit different what we're actually doing today, and uh, we're um, presenting work that's aligned with uh, the theme of uh, what is being discussed today rather than uh, an overview of our work. So what I'd like to do is just give you a brief snapshot in terms of the provincial summary. Uh, the success in terms of physical distancing that it's had in really keeping the case trajectories down for our province, and also the importance of daily contacts and contact tracing. So this is our, our cases in terms of the numbers that are active, which are very few right now. Most have recovered, thankfully, and unfortunately three have uh, passed away. And as you can see, that the total number of patients is quite small uh, um, for the size of a population, which is uh, excellent. It's really where you want to be. So when you actually look at our trajectory as, uh, as compared to where it could have been, we're actually in the very strong epidemic control. Uh, this is because of a very, very uh, quick uh, 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 contact tracing and then subsequently quarantine and isolation when appropriate, and as well, a uh, high amount of physical distancing. And so a small number of Newfoundlanders have uh, been affected with the virus. Um, as compared to what it could have been with weaker control, where a larger proportion of the population may have been uh, affected. 
Now, why is it important in terms of the percentage of population that are affected? That makes a big deal in terms of clinical outcome. In other words, the more people that you have affected in the province, the greater the number that are hospitalized in ICU and in death. And once you get to this blue region, there's so many people in the ICU that the number of death actually goes up, not um, uh, in a very high rate, uh, only because your ICU cannot uh, contain it. So you really want to be in the green side and as low as possible. And right now, we're about 0.1% of our population is affected, which is uh, excellent. This is in large due to, uh, large measure, sorry, uh, due to the time that um, uh, the health measures were taken in terms of stay-at-home orders. Um, and as well, uh, just congratulations to the populations in terms of the terrific they have, job they have done in terms of physically distancing to really get this reproduction number, which is the number of people that you secondary reflect to less than one, but well less than one. Um, and then subsequently, this is from uh, the cases that we had till uh, May 27th, uh, the numbers were very, very low. So this is a terrific response uh, due in part uh, to the population buying into the public health measures. So we're really grateful uh, for all your work regarding this. So what we're going to talk to you today about is as we start to open up, you're going to find that you're going to go out more, you're going to run into people. And so the number of potential contacts are going to increase. So if one individual is, inf uh, is infected here with COVID-19, there's a chance that they're going to come into a certain number of contacts. So what contact tracing does is that if you can identify these individuals, a way of preventing spread to the community is to isolate them so that they can't infect others. So in this particular scenario with 10 individuals, if you can isolate seven of them, that's a 70% contact tracing. So if you have 70% contact tracing, that's quite good. But the question is, what can you do to actually help us with this? And the, the thing to really remember is that the lower number of contacts that you have, the less it's going to be in the population. So you might not think there's that much of a difference between six contacts per day, a contact being someone that's close enough, you're close enough to that you can potentially transmit the virus as compared to eight or 10. These numbers seem similar, but it makes a very big difference in terms of the population that it can be infected with COVID-19. So what you really want to do is to keep the contacts as low as possible. Now imagine if there was an outbreak and we're really busy in terms of contact tracing and our successful contact tracing, instead of having seven individuals, goes down to six out of 10. In other words, 60%. What would happen then? With 60% contact tracing, even if you had eight contacts, you'd realize that the large proportion of the population is affected. So what it's telling us that we have to be even more careful in terms of number of contacts. What we really want to do with public health as they're really trying their best in terms of protecting you is to give them breathing space. Okay, And the way we can actually do this is to reduce the number of contacts the least number possible. And if you must go out where you're going to have very close contact, uh, please wear a mask. The other element in terms of contact tracing, it's not only um, the number of contacts, it's also the time uh, to isolation of these contacts. And what it's showing here, which is intuitive in some ways, um, is that the quicker you actually identify a contact and isolate them, the less they're likely to spread. And again, the lower the number of contacts it is, the easier it is for public health and all these experienced contact tracers to do their job. So we can make it easy for everyone by just trying to limit the number of contacts we have uh, per day. And as uh, for the recommendation that actually came uh, from Dr. Fitzgerald today to potentially um, increasing your bubble size to up to six, that's a little bit hard for us to model in some ways um, using the approach that we're uh, doing um, here in, at Memorial. But what we could say relatively confidently is that having no more than six contact outside your double bubble results in a really small risk in reinstating Alert 5 over the next year. A slightly better approach that we actually have in looking at the impact of contact is to do agent-based simulation. And as of next week, hopefully we're going to get uh, this work started because it took a while uh, to collect the data and then fine-tune the code for this uh, 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 sort of uh, very important work that we're about to do. So what we did uh, is um, Dr. Dion Elman, who's actually in our team from University of Toronto, used data from Toronto, because uh, she already had the model built there, 
to ask this question. So what would happen if we had six contacts that actually came into the bubble? And she ran the simulation for Toronto. That's why the numbers here are a little bit larger. And what it's showing is that adding six contacts to your double bubble does not really increase the risk appreciably. And Dr. Fitzgerald said it's about balance and on balance. Uh, this is certainly a reasonable thing to do. So in conclusion, uh, physical distancing has helped reduce the burden uh, of COVID-19 in Newfoundland. And it's really the most important factor, I think, in, in, in allowing us uh, uh, to have a really low number of cases. The number of contacts are a significant factor as we go forward in determining how quickly the virus spreads. So the lower the number of contacts, the better off we'll all be. Um, case identification and isolation, contact tracing and quarantine are essential when relaxing public health measures. And you can actually do your part by reducing the number of contacts because this makes it even more efficient. And finally, as you've heard before, to slow the spread, please maintain physical distancing. Just think ahead a few steps, you know, so you don't get too close to someone and maintain hygiene practices. Uh, thank you, Premier. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahman, for today's presentation. And it certainly his opening comments about strong epidemic control in, the, in his opening words were, I guess all of us would really thank Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and, and say congratulations for the work that you've been able to do. But also be mindful that, you know, the virus is still within our communities and we must continue to limit the number of contacts. So be responsible, I guess, is the message today for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Uh, today's message, very informative. It's good information for us to have, have as we continue to work together with our new normal, which is life with COVID. As you know, we had 20 days with no new cases until yesterday. And the 20 day streak, a streak is a result of the due diligence that you've been able to do as a, as a population. We thank you for your commitment and your wisdom. It was a good streak, but this one case that was reported yesterday, this was not unexpected as has been said by this table so many times. So you can re remain confident that the plan that's been put in place and even along the way, you can expect the odd case uh, from, from day to day. So we know, and that's because we know that the virus is still amongst us and we can see results coming out of Atlantic Canada in recent days, that it's still here and it could potentially be at your doorstep. So although we, uh, we see ourselves easing up on some of the measures, we need everyone to continue to follow the guidelines that have been set out. Now easing up doesn't mean that you can bend the rules or you can look for loopholes. Just a reminder that if you come to Newfoundland and Labrador from out of the province, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Just a reminder, and if you have questions in relation to traveling or self-isolation, call 811 or you can go to our COVID website. Uh, today there will be a news release that will be going out just shortly to provide an update on child care services. I know I was asked about this a couple days ago and many people have been uh, concerned about this in recent days. So the compensation grant program that was put in place will continue to June the 26th. And of course, this was for the support that we put in place for essential workers and the child care program. It was one of the most generous, by the way, uh, support packages that was across the country. It was a $70 million investment into our essential workers. The regulated child care services are currently operating at a 50% capacity under alert level four. And you'll see that as we move into alert level three, expand it to a 70% capacity. Now, uh, before I pass it over to the minister today, I have just a brief update on the business response team. I know many people have been asking and inquiring about this. So, so far there's a thousand inquiries, uh, 917 of those have been complete and the rest are being worked on. And some of the common themes around, would be around tourism supports, of course, uh, that we announced earlier uh, this week, but also about restaurants, camping, salons, uh, retail outlets and accommodations are just some of the topics that people are interested in. I also know people have some interest in about the number of people that move in to or they're coming into our province and this would be at all entry points. There's some 250 people that came in yesterday so it just goes to show that there's a limited number of travelers that are coming into Newfoundland and Labrador. So as we head into the weekend a reminder that your updates will be provided around 2 o'clock on Saturday and Sunday. So we ask you to be careful over the weekend and you can pick up uh, the information on our daily briefings right here again on Monday. So please forget, uh, don't forget to take care of yourself as you work our way through this. This weekend would be a good time to get out and get some fresh air. Call 
some of those loved ones that you haven't talked to in a while, that you have not been connected in a while, just give them a call and have them a chat, have a chat with them. Always please remain positive, remain optimistic as best we can, and let's continue to look for new ways of living life in Newfoundland and Labrador with COVID. So stay safe over the weekend, and I will now pass it over to Minister Hagee for his comments. Thank you very much, uh, Premier, and again, Zero. Uh, we have done very well and continue to, uh, to hold the line or hold fast, as uh, Dr. Fitzgerald says. Uh, Dr. Rahman's provided us with uh, a scientific background for Dr. Fitzgerald's uh, uh, recommendations around uh, increasing the size of your social circle, really. Uh, it's uh, less of a bubble now and more a bubbling, perhaps. Um, the, the issue, however... Uh, and we saw this when uh, the, the doubling of the bubble was announced some, uh, some weeks ago. Um, I think people are worried about uh, exercising their own discretion. Uh, and we found ourselves as a department being asked to, to arbitrate choices uh, uh, within families uh, and, and almost to, uh, to decide and make choices for families. And we can't do that. Uh, and I think it's incumbent on everybody to do as Dr. Fitzgerald has said, uh, do you really need to increase your so social circle? Uh, you have your double bubble. If you do, uh, and these friends and supports are important to you, and bear in mind they too have bubbles of their own, and you have to do it in a responsible way, uh, and that is a matter of, of your choice and your discretion. Uh, all being well with the current climate and a, and a fairly low prevalence of the virus in the province, this will not lead to difficulties, and we won't have to go backwards, as other provinces have had to uh, with some of their measures lately. Um, the uh, issue around um, a little bit more freedom for what we call the turnaround workers or the rotational workers, I think, comes in the spirit of recognizing that um, the mental health consequences of isolation uh, can be as grievous in many respects as the physical ones, and this is um, a, a safe give from a public health point of view, again, providing it's done responsibly. Uh, and I think as we open things up, that element of personal responsibility is really going to become more key in how these, uh, these recommendations, these guidelines and these orders uh, are, um, are, are shaped by everybody within the province. Uh, as we move into uh, the level three uh, and we open up even more, that element of personal discretion and personal responsibility will continue uh, to be prominent and gain even more prominence. Uh, with restaurants opening up uh, uh, after the 8th, albeit with limited capacity, uh, it's really going to be a matter of exercising discretion around travel uh, and the whole concept of whether or not this is uh, um, something you, you would like to do, uh, you would need to do. But the option is there, and it's there for you to exercise, and it's there to help stimulate the economy and, and, and bring us a little bit nearer whatever our future normal may well be. But again, um, it's part of a graduated move, and we need to walk before we can run. Uh, and these kind of relaxations are part of the journey back towards uh, that future normal and the staycation, for example, as we we leave the school year behind over the course of the next month and move into summer. So again, you have your expanded bubble. You have now uh, a social network you can look at. Uh, use it wisely. Um, and remember the, the four words that uh, the Dr. Fitzgerald said about people, space, time, and place. So again, look after your bubble, respect it, and respect everyone else's. Uh, and if we continue the way we are, then we're set for uh, more than likely a, a move to level three uh, in a week's time. So with that, Premier, I'll, uh, I'll uh, hand it back to you. Thank you, Minister. And I will now turn it over to the media for the questions for today. <clears throat> Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, we have five reporters registered for today's call. Each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. We suggest that you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order that they registered for today's call. Please do not press star 1 until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, there will be an opportunity for single questions. Our first questions today 
are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm wondering if there's more information on the new case that uh, was announced yesterday. We know it was travel related. Did this person self-isolate immediately upon uh, arrival to Newfoundland and Labrador? Yes, this pe uh, person has been uh, in self-isolation uh, since their return. Okay, great. And um, with, with that, I, I'm supposing that they're a resident of Newfoundland and Labrador, and that's what brought them here? I'm sorry, Kellyanne, I missed, I missed that. Oh, sorry. I'm wondering if um, they're an essential worker or if they live here. The reasoning for coming to Newfoundland and Labrador. They're a resident of Newfoundland and Labrador, and they were returning home is my understanding. Perfect, thank you. Yes. And I just want to touch on the expansion of the bubble here, maybe to clarify for um, people. In terms of expanding your bubble, um, saying I wanted to expand with somebody, Gander or Clarenville, is that something that is allowed at this point, knowing that I reside in St. John's? So I think you have to you have to take that into consideration. Obviously, uh, the intent here was to expand it to somebody who could give you that kind of support that you that you need and uh, that uh, you know friendship, camaraderie, and and uh, someone you frequently saw. Um, if that's somebody in Clarenville, I suppose, then um, you know, then that's up to you. Um, it's uh, but you do have to remember that once those changes are once those decisions are made, they really should not change. So um, whatever you know, choose carefully, I suppose, and and. Uh, um, make sure that, uh, you know, the choice that you're making is the right one for you and for the person you're asking to come into your bubble because you have to take that into consideration as well and the other people that are in your bubble with you, in your double bubble especially with you. I think, Kellyanne, too, one of the things you remember is going back to Dr. Rama's points is that, you know, this is about contacts. And if you, you know, if you want to expand your bubble to someone that lives far away, well, uh, you know, the risk of making contacts along the way to getting that visit in place is important, you know, uh, as, as you make your decision of those people that you want to expand to. So there's always touch points along the way. The further people are away to you, there's the potential of having contacts, you know, just by stopping along the way, you know, as you go on uh, to visit someone, you know, that is, you know, to that extreme, that far away. So lots of things to consider, but the important thing is, is get the people around you that you, uh, that support you best in your life and the people that you, uh, uh, you know, that you're looking forward to seeing. It's really about making sure you look after your mental health and make sure that you uh, can socialize and are responsible and makes, make, what makes common sense to you. Thank you. Our next questions are from Marie Isabel Rochon of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Just looking for more detail about the new case from yesterday. How many people have been contacted and how many of them are currently self-isolating because of this new case? Uh, so this new case has been self-isolating since um, they returned. So they actually have very few contacts. I, I think it's in the in one or two at the most. And uh, all of those people have been advised and uh, um, are quarantining as we speak. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and seeing what is happening right now in New Brunswick with the new out outbreak with three new cases in the Campbellton region, uh, aren't you afraid that something similar might happen here if you allow people who work outside the province uh, to not com completely self-isolate? So what we've advised is that those people uh, would not, um, you know, they would maintain physical distancing if they were off their property. Um, and they were outside. So we know the risk for spread outside is a fair bit lower than if it's inside. We've asked or not permitted that they uh, they can enter, um, you know, public buildings. So the stores the um, go into um, a gas station or a drugstore or the post office or, or bank. Um, that wouldn't be allowed. But, you know, for their mental health to be able to stay within their bubble and to uh, get out and walk or go for a drive, uh, the risk is very low to the people around them. And of course, this assumes, assumes that they're not symptomatic and that they're not coming from a place that's in outbreak. If, uh, of course, if either of those things are true, that's a different story. Okay. And uh, my last question, um, Transport Canada announced that there, were, that there will be no major international cruise ships uh, in Canada until October 31st. Uh, how do you react to this decision? 
You know, for me, the reaction of that, I think right now they will work with the province, and I think there's a, a, a <coughs> number, when it comes to capacity, the large cruise ships that you've just mentioned was something that I know there was complete agreement with uh, from all uh, premiers when this was, uh, when this decision was discussed, you know, based on the uh, advice that came from public health. But also, I think there's some discretion within the province we need to, you know, keep in mind about particular events that will be held there as people move around the province. So there's working with uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and working with our tourism ministry, but also working with public health officials. I think the limit now is up to 100 people, but of course, that would not be a gathering that would be uh, permitted in Newfoundland and Labrador. So it's important to take the advice of public health officials as we move slowly and cautiously in reopening the economy. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of C Please go ahead. Dr. Fitzgerald, as you sort of expand the definition of the bubble, it starts to make things even more complicated as you now have two groups of people who all have to decide on who the six people are to add. Why did you decide to go this route rather than some other provinces which have essentially said, keep your gatherings to only, say, six or eight people from a couple of households? So I think that's kind of what we have done, um, and uh, we've just uh, been a, a little more prescriptive, I think. Um, we want to give people some um, uh, some break from, from this, separa this social separation that we've had, and even though people can connect virtually, uh, you know, I guess there's nothing like really being able to see someone in person. So we've, um, you know, every province is going to do something a little bit differently. Um, there's... I think we're all basically doing the same thing. We're just doing what we think will work for us. I, I don't think you need to read anything too much into why things are different. I think we're all basically ending up in the same place. Um, but uh, this is about, you know, for the most part, grown-ups making decisions about how they're going to uh, move forward and, and create more contacts in their lives. And I think people are quite capable of doing that. Premier, uh, why aren't you talking to other Atlantic provinces about allowing some sort of travel between provinces this summer? What do you say to tourism operators for whom this could mean the difference between going out of business and surviving? We are talking to other provinces about, you know, the Atlantic bubble. Every single premier in Atlantic Canada right now, we all were in complete alignment and all agree. First and foremost, you had to move safely amongst your own province. So. In order for you to open up to any border, you must prove that you can move around your own province. And that is true for PEI, that is true for New Brunswick, it is true for Nova Scotia. So that's the position that we're taking. And as we expand those borders, if indeed we do so this summer, that's a decision that will be made working with public health officials and the other premiers. As an example, there's a, you know, there's a, you know, you'd believe if you read some of the things that's been said that there's some 2,600 people that will come to PEI. Uh, for you know summer homes and home property there, but you, in order to go to PEI in that situation, you've got to fill it, uh, an exemption order. So you know what, travel around provinces in some ways is very restricted. And first of all, I think fundamental in all of this is let's move around Newfoundland and Labrador safely and responsibly before we expand those borders. Minister Hagee, you've said all along that essential procedures can happen if the doctor feels that it's important. What would you say to Linda King, who had to go to a private clinic to get an ultrasound, only to find out that she'd miscarried weeks before but never found out because her appointments were cancelled? I can't comment on a specific case, Peter, and, and I think you appreciate why and, and, and the facts behind, around that. The bottom line is that at any stage, should a clinician have felt uh, a particular test is relevant to a person's immediate management, that test was never denied, it was never unavailable, it was always there, literally no more than a phone call away. Uh, so uh, that has been uh, my position. It has been my instructions to the RHAs, and they have had, as far as I am aware, no difficulties in adhering to that. Thank you. Our next questions are from Alison King of the OCM News. Please go ahead. A case of COVID-19. Can you tell us where exactly that case uh, originated from? Um, so the travel came from out of the country, um, and uh, I think originally from Africa. Okay. Um, can you give me some examples of where rotational workers 
may be able to self-isolate if not on their property, for example, would they be able to walk through a public park if they were being physically distant? So I think as long as they're being physically distant, um, they can walk in their neighborhood, they can walk on a trail, um, they can ride their bike uh, on a street, they can ride their bike on a trail. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's it's really about common sense. People need to respect others um, and the risk of uh, transmission if you're passing somebody very quickly on a trail is quite low, especially outdoors. Um, so, you know, we have to bear that in mind. Um, the physical toll, if you can imagine, you know, people, we're asking people who come into this province to self-isolate for 14 days, and that means they can't leave their property, they can't go anywhere. If you imagine that out of 28 days or uh, 30 days, you're spending 28 of those not being able to move off your property, because a lot of these people, when they go to work, they can go to their job site, but then they have to go back and self-isolate after that. Um, you know, that can take a great toll uh, on your mental health. And uh, most of these people are aware of the risks. They don't want to spread it to anyone. Uh, I firmly believe that most people want to keep everyone as safe as possible and would feel uh, terrible um, if they if they came into contact with COVID and, and spread that. I think, I think that's true for most people. Nobody intentionally wants to do that. So um, I, I think we have to strike a balance here uh, for these workers. Thank you. And with Alert Level 3 on the way and retail shops opening, what is being recommended to shopping malls when it comes to controlling how many people can be in the entire building versus each individual store? So those are all things that are being worked out um, by the, um, you know, through the uh, uh, industry itself and through the associations that uh, work in those industries. So, um, but certainly uh, we know that there needs to be some measure of control about how many people are allowed in a building. Um, malls are quite large, so uh, the number of people that would be allowed um, could be um, a fair bit larger than what we would expect, say, to see in a, a smaller store. Um, but uh, uh, all those details are being uh, worked out as at, at this moment. Okay, thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, these uh, double bubbles, uh, I'm already getting questions on this as the news has gotten out. And uh, I just want to make sure you have two families that are basically like the Walton, like they have about 10, 12 people each. They're now 24 as a double bubble. They get six more. They can have 30 people, theoretically. Is this, um, so is this is actually okay under this new situation, is it? So you're saying we have two families of 10 or 12 people that have come together yeah, to make a double bubble? Yeah, and they more to that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, certainly if there's a double... I, I, I guess what I'm asking is this doesn't actually put a cap on the total number of two bubbles and, uh, and the six actors. No. So what we're saying is you can add six people to your double bubble. Um, I mean, what your double, we didn't put a restriction on what the size of a double bubble would be. Um, those people are all close contacts. Obviously, you know, part of, of this, as Dr. Raman explained, was to help, you know, we need to strike a balance between giving people um, giving people some of that relief that they need from being, from, from being separated from other people, uh, along with uh, balancing the risk of spread to the community should a case of COVID get into the community as well as um, making sure that that contact tracing that we do can be uh, facilitated as quickly and efficiently as possible. So if people who are within a double bubble are going to be easily identifiable to people who are doing contact tracing, um, so that's, that's a very different thing than if you had 24 contacts outside of your double bubble and you didn't know who those people were because you were all at a gathering somewhere, for example. So, um, you know, the, the numbers that we're talking about here, it's, it's more about um, outside of your bubble that, that these, um, con the numbers are important. Outside of your double bubble, okay. I should say. Sorry? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, 
Okay. I thought someone was trying to come in. Oh, I just said outside um, your double bubble. I just corrected myself. That's all, Peter. Sorry. Oh, okay. Right. Um, I have a question for Dr. Rahman. Um, and I think this might have been asked at, at previous uh, presentations, but I just want to know if these models account in any way for the sparse geography and population of the province. Uh, it will, absolutely. So uh, that's a really good question, Peter. Um, if I can just get back to the one that Jack asked previously about the number of people uh, that you can have. Um, so what's really important in a bubble, just in terms of modeling, is compliance within the bubble, not necessarily the number. So it's really important not to cheat, right? And so if you're out and about, um, then you can actually make, break many bubbles. And that actually, from a population perspective and the spread is a lot worse than the natural size of the bubble. So whatever your natural bubble is, if that's what it is, it doesn't seem to be as critical a factor as um, cheating uh, within that particular bubble. And when we actually model, we actually model based on the population. So what was actually done uh, using the agent-based simulation from Toronto is that the family size range from one to six, here it's from one to five. But some of these large families will be captured because the families are at, 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 you know, as it is. And so that'll be part of the modeling that'll actually be done. So if a family happens to be large, it's sort of accounted for, but you don't want to artificially increase that family size or, or cheat, as uh, the Premier had said. In, term your, in terms of your question, I think spatial structure is really important to the province. And it's one of the advantages the province has had, I think, in keeping the numbers as is. And it really has to be accounted for. Um, so the agent-based simulation that we're about to undertake, for which we've gathered the data, uh, will actually account uh, for the spatial structure. And I think we'll uh, really be able to understand what's happening in the different regions and uh, which regions are at more risk for various reasons. Okay, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to clarify, uh, when you talked about the two different uh, scenarios of contact tracing, do we know what the current level of contact tracing is? Um, we actually have excellent contact tracing here. It is well above 90% of contacts um, identified, and I think, in fact, it's closer to 100%. Okay, thank you. Before we end today's call, we'll take one more question from starting with Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. <clears throat> so I'm wondering if there's been any more decisions made on uh, allowing more support care or longer support care for uh, pregnancies. We have um, been looking at that uh, along with visitation in general for uh, hospital acute care, long-term care and personal care home. Uh, at the moment, we have not uh, felt it's sensible or wise to change. Um, when we get into level three, I think uh, there may be some opportunities there. But the question is, uh, and the challenge is, whilst it's one visitor for a resident or, or a patient, uh, you have to be equitable. Uh, and therefore, in um, a big facility where you have 160 beds, that is 160 people extra through the doors of the building. And if each visitor swaps out every day, that uh, it starts to grow geometrically. So the challenge is really what is a way of allowing extra without swamping hospitals with visitors. You only have to go back to February, January month, stand in the lobby of an acute care facility and see it is really busy. And that is your risk. All those people, it's about people, it's about space, it's about time and it's about the place and they're all wrong in the lobby of a hospital. Thank you. Our next question is Marie Isabel Rochon of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. I'm wondering, do we have a time frame from this uh, double bubble to six people? So is there um, a, a date in your mind where we're going to be able to expand more this, uh, this measure? Um, well, it's been 28 days since we, or it's 29 days now, since we expanded the last bubble. Um, and so we wanted to do this a little bit in advance of level three. And we'll certainly uh, be looking at how things are going as we move through level three. And we'll make some decisions, um, we'll make some decisions throughout level three as to uh, how that may or may be able to be expanded. But, you know, it will depend on what, uh, what happens in level three and how our situation evolves in response to opening up and people moving around more. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. 
<clears throat> Our next question is from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. For Dr. Rahman, looking at all the numbers that you've been crunching and the models and everything else, is there any evidence right now that there, uh, this disease is in the community here in Newfoundland and Labrador? Uh, thanks, Peter, for your question. Uh, so the models don't necessarily reflect reality at times, the way they are, the assumptions that are put in. Um, and so you, when you use a, rom, uh, a random stochastic model, it's really hard to get to a number of zeros. So all we can say is that the probability uh, for an infection within the province is really, really low. All that being said, it also doesn't take account of the people that are actually coming in daily as well. Um, and so that importation risk is not actually put into that model right now. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, the risk uh, of community spread, given the model right now, is very, very low. Thank you. The next question is from Allison King of the OCM News. Please go ahead. Operator, are you able to manually open that line, please? Her line is open. Hi. Um, are people still being discouraged from traveling across the province if they would be staying either in a hotel or another registered establishment? So at the moment, we're, uh, you know, recommending that uh, if you're if you're traveling to certainly stay within your bubble, um, you should think about sticking as close to home as you can. Um, we will certainly have more uh, information as we move through the levels and as we go into level three, uh, we'll be making some recommendations about travel. And the final question today is from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. I'm, I'm I'm curious about the uh, workers coming in. I want to make sure that that does not mean if they are allowed outside their house now, but they are not allowed in retail establishments, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so, you know, the, the goal of that measure was to try to allow them to get out, uh, to get uh, some fresh air, uh, to be able to interact with their family in a, situ in a, a setting outside of their, their home, and uh, to be able to get some exercise. Um, but we had to try to balance public safety because these people are coming from out of the province and some of them from areas that have a higher prevalence of disease than we do. Uh, and so, um, you know, we want to reduce the risk of them running into people in a uh, higher risk situation such as indoors or into a higher number of people uh, in a situation where they may not be able to physically distance. Thank you. Thank you very much. The time for questions has ended for today. Please join us again on Monday, June 1st at 2 p.m., 1.30 in most of Labrador. Have a great weekend, everyone.